Welcome to another episode of Give and Go, SI.com's critically acclaimed web series, where we debate three of the biggest storylines in the NBA. In today's episode, we discuss Paul George's impact in Indiana, Toronto's status as a contender in the East, and if a surging bull can sneak in and steal the Rookie of the Year award. Joining me today is a man fresh off his first Southern California surfing lesson, SI.com writer Ben Golliver. How are you, Ben? I'm good, just dodging sharks out here. It's a tough life. Yeah, really, got to be tough. I feel bad for you. All right, topic number one. Eight months after a gruesome compound fracture at his leg, Paul George returned to the Pacer lineup on Sunday, scoring 13 points in 15 minutes. Ben, the Pacers are a game out with five to play. Can Paul George help them close the gap and make the postseason? Well, I definitely think he helps, no question about it. Even though he didn't look perfect, you know, not by any means. I think he was a little bit out of sync at times. You saw him in transition maybe, uh, you know, not totally in control, getting some offensive foul calls, throwing up some bad shots. But, hey, his jump shot didn't look too bad, especially when he had his feet set. You know, his shooting form looked pretty good. He had a number of three-pointers. I was at that game in Las Vegas when he got injured, and it was horrible. I mean, anybody who was there was probably rooting for uh, Paul George to just take the rest of the season and chill. Don't rush back. Don't let something else happen. And I think Paul George's debut was really kind of a statement against people who had that thinking, myself included. I didn't think he looked too bad at all. And, you know, if he has a chance to be a difference maker here in the short term, I can understand why he would want to be back out there and why they would want him back out there. I guess I'm just watching with my fingers crossed a little bit. Yeah, he made some shots, no question about that. And I certainly was surprised by his overall production. I do think he's probably only going to be a 15-minute-per-game guy for the rest of the year just because conditioning-wise, I don't care how many practices you play in, the game is an entirely different story. So maybe he can contribute coming off the bench. And more than anything, Ben, I think he can be an emotional lift to this team. I think just having him back in that locker room available to play, I think it's going to give them a boost. The question is, are there enough games left for this team to close that one game gap gap with Boston and make the postseason. They've got three games on the road, Ben, two at home. The home games are against playoff teams. I just don't know if they've got enough time to close the gap against the Celtics, the Nets, and the other teams at the top of the conference. Yeah, I think you need like a magic eight ball or tarot cards to kind of figure out who's going to come out at the bottom of that Eastern Conference race. But I don't think he hurts in any way, right? And I don't think he would be back on the court if he did hurt. Uh, so why not go out there? You know, and it's also just generating some positive momentum going into next season. Once they're really going to have to try to figure out where does this franchise go? Because they were at a real peak these last couple of years. Uh, this past season, I think, has been a really depressing, kind of forgettable season. Let's build some positive me- momentum. I'm sure that's what they're thinking uh, as they look you know, going forward into the longer-term future. Yeah, I think Frank Vogel was on point when he said that you're not going to expect the old Paul George, the explosive Paul George, until next season. You can give them what they can give them in 15 minutes per game, but he's just not going to be the same player, not until we get to next year. All right, topic number two. Toronto has dropped two straight and is 5-5 five and five in its last 10 games. The fast start to the season is now long since forgotten. So, Ben, I'll ask you this. Are the Raptors contenders or are they pretenders? Oh, they're totally pretenders. Chris, this is my favorite stat. You're going to love this one. Since the All-Star break, the Toronto Raptors have a worse defense than the New York Knicks. Can you believe that? Yes, love stats. (laughs) The only team with a worse defense since the All-Star break than Toronto is the Minnesota Timberwolves, and we know where they're at. you know. But there is one saving grace here for Toronto. Uh, their most likely potential first-round matchups, uh, you know, pretty much have bad offenses. You know, teams like uh, the Washington Wizards have really struggled down the stretch offensively. The Milwaukee Bucks just haven't been the same since that Brandon uh, Knight trade. So to me, even though they look toast from a sort of contender standpoint, I just don't think you can have a defense as poor as theirs and make any sort of real noise in the Eastern Conference. I think they do have, still have a chance to win a series. And if you're Toronto in that franchise, isn't winning a series sort of a victory in and of itself? I mean, this is not a team that's been known to make tons and tons of deep playoff runs in its playoff history. So if they can build on last year's playoff appearance uh, and win a first-round series, I think everybody in that organization should consider that a win. Yeah, look, the Raptors were kind of fool's gold early on in the sense that they were able to win some games early in the season because they had more continuity than virtually every other team out there. This is the only team really in the top of the Eastern Conference playoff race that has been together for as long as they've been together. But as the season progressed, you did start to see a lot of their holes, particularly defensively. Ben, I I get that stat. That's an incredible stat in the second half of the year. I'll just throw it at you again. The top 10 last year in defensive efficiency, they're 26th overall this year. What did they change? It was Lou Williams. 
That was add to this mix. Now, Lou is not a great defensive player, but can he possibly be responsible <laughs> for a 16-place uh, gap between what they were last year and what they are this year with this team? I look at the fact that some of their third-year guys just have not stepped up and played in bigger roles, specifically a guy like Jonas Valanciunas, who I think they were really counting on to be that kind of inside presence. And I think you're right. If they do play Washington in the first round, great chance to beat the Wizards because the Wizards are just as big a train wreck as the Raptors are right now. <laughs> but once they get past that first-round series, I don't give them any chance against a Cleveland or an Atlanta. Well, yeah. I mean, you can go up and down the, the roster in terms of reasons why they've struggled defensively. I mean, I'm interested to see if they can win this playoff series. Can they hold it together? Can Lowry put these back spasms behind him, come out and sort of being the conquering hero returning in that first round series? Uh, I think he has a chance to do it, and it's going to be an interesting matchup either way, whether it's, uh, you know, John Wall, Michael Carter-Williams. I mean, either way, you know, Lowry's going to have to be the guy who carries them because I'm not sure who else will do it on that roster. 10th to 26th, that's going to drive Dwayne Casey absolutely nuts. Dwayne's one of the better defensive minds in basketball. I know I get the injuries, but my God, that is a massive fall from what this team was last year. All right, topic number three. For months, it has appeared to be a two-player race for Rookie of the Year, with Andrew Wiggins maintaining a healthy lead over Nerlens Noel. But in the last month, Nikola Mirotic has given voters like myself something to think about. Mirotic has become injury-riddled Chicago's go-to player. Has he done enough, Ben, to win the award? Well, he's done enough to make it a very exciting race here. And I think it's a great setup between sort of the old school approach and the new school approach. Because the old school approach would say, hey, this is Wiggins sort of in a landslide, right? I mean, minutes, points per game. I mean, all the kind of traditional methods we usually use to evaluate players, say, back in the day uh, for awards. Uh, you know, Wiggins is sort of the, the clear winner. But if you look at the advanced stats, you know, the MIT Sloan stats of the world, whether it's a PER, whether it's sort of net rating, whether it's just kind of impact stats, win shares. I mean, all of those really do f favor uh, Miritic. And he's really, you know, done it on a winning team, too, which is going to come into the discussion as well. Because, you know, of course, everything fell apart around Wiggins, you know, very early in Minnesota, whether it was Rubio going down, all these other injuries that he had to deal with. Uh, and, of course, you know, Minnesota was just not a team that had any real expectations. So they remain in the basement, and they're just sort of easy to kind of cast aside. Well, in Chicago, there was some adversity as well, and, and he really stepped up, and you got to give him credit for it. Yeah, that's what it comes down to. Do the numbers that he's putting up on a good team, are they valued more than bigger numbers that Wiggins and Noel are putting up on bad teams? And I think a lot of this discussion goes back to last year, and people must be wondering to themselves, am I really going to vote for another player on a really, really, really bad team, whether it's Noel and the Wobegon Sixers or with Wiggins on a Timberwolves team that hasn't been really relevant team-wise since probably December. And I think what Miritic has done over this last month or so in really carrying the Bulls in the abs of Jimmy Butler and Derrick Rose has to count for something. And I'm really torn on this, Ben, uh, as a voter. I look at this situation, I say, well, you know, these guys, Wiggins probably going to be the best player in this group. I think Noel is going to be a very serviceable player in his position. Both those players might turn out to be better than Miritich down the line. But Miritich in this last month, month and a half or so, has emerged as Chicago's go-to guy in the fourth quarter. His uh, percentage of points he's putting up in the fourth quarter at about 36% is higher than the percentage that LeBron's putting up in Cleveland. He's right around 31%. All these numbers that come into play, like you mentioned, they all sway towards Miritich in terms of team success. And that, to me, has to count for a lot. All right, great job, Ben. Appreciate you taking some time out of that wetsuit. Enjoy the waves. I will. Thanks, Chris. That's it for Give and Go. Catch us this week and every week right here on SI.com.